What's the optimum ISO? Is it the default ISO? But why is the native ISO on this camera 100, but on others it's 160 or even 64? How much noise is good noise? Where does the noise come from and how can I deal with it? Today, these and other mysteries of the universe will be solved. Before we get stuck in, I think it's important that we let our tiny brains re-familiarise ourselves with what ISO actually is. Is this a piece of your brain? <laughs> Let's jump back to film. If you wanted to work in low light, you'd have to buy a roll of 800 or 1600 ISO, but the results would be a bit grainy. If you wanted better quality and had plenty of available light, then you could opt for Kodachrome 64 or Ektachrome 100 and have much lower levels of grain. So in simple terms, the ISO number described the sensitivity of the film to light, and the higher the sensitivity, the more grainy the results, due to the increased size of the light-sensitive crystals called silver halide, which is embedded into the film emulsion. Well, that was analog and now we're in the digital age. And guess what? It's pretty much the same. Well, the results of high ISO are at least similar, more noise. Although how this happens is somewhat different, and we're coming to that shortly. First though, we still have ISO numbers. 100 ISO is twice as sensitive to light as 50 ISO. 400 is twice as sensitive as 200. It's double, 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 half, 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 and so on. It's very similar to the aperture table. Double the amount of light, double the amount of light, double, half the amount of light, half the amount of light, half the amount of light, etc. The ISO just stands for International Standards Organization, the official gatekeepers of standards, which actually replaced ASA the American Standards Organization when Fuji in Japan realized that America didn't need to rule the whole world. But we don't change film in our cameras anymore, so how can I get a different ISO when there is only one sensor in the camera? Good question. Well, effectively, the sensor is the sensor. It has a base ISO or default ISO. Anything else is just an amplified or reduced derivative of that. So what this means is that a camera's sensor's default ISO is where the sensor manufacturer believes the sensor will deliver the best image. And through their R&D on their processing engine, signal conversion and photo site size, they would have decided that for a particular sensor, then a particular ISO provides the best picture quality and the best dynamic range. That is the widest gamut of recordable tones. That camera company may discover that ISO 100 was the optimum base ISO and lower ISOs, such as 64 or 50, would be achieved by de-amplifying the signal. Other manufacturers may decide that their sensor and processing perform best at 200 ISO or 64 ISO and so on. This then becomes their default ISO. For example, most cameras have a default ISO of 100, but Nikon often ran at 200 ISO as default and for some video cameras, it may be much higher. Increasing the ISO from say 100 to 800, gaining you three stops of exposure, isn't really changing ISO, like changing to a more sensitive film. Instead, what is happening is that electronic signals from the photo sites now have to be amplified to get more exposure out of them. Because remember, the amount of photons striking the photo site on the sensor remain the same, unless, of course, you actually added more light. It's a bit like turning the volume up on your music system. It's the same data going in from the needle or laser to your speaker. It's just getting amplified, 
and for the most part it will be okay. But at some point, things might get a bit distorted. So we have light going to the photosites, conversion to an electronic signal, an analog to digital converter called an ADC, and then an amplification before quantization to numerical RGB values. The amplification process is a factor that causes noise, which also has an effect on dynamic range, because at the native ISO, the dynamic range was presumed at its best. Taking the small number of photons striking a photosite and converting these into an electronic signal incurs a phenomena known as shot noise. Something called discrete probability distribution or Poisson distribution dictates that a very small number of photons will result in a greater level of fluctuations in the processing signal, which permeate as shot noise. But noise in a digital image can be from several factors. Thermal noise and Gaussian noise sadly just exist in electronic circuits. It's a bit like sand in your underpants. You just can't get rid of it. Then there is quantization noise, which is the product of image processing and the compression of numerical values of image data. Fortunately though, quantization noise is more uniform and usually not as distracting. Quantization error can be minimized by the use of a higher bit depth ADC, giving a more accurate assignment of the signal to a finer digital step. This has to be balanced against speed of processing the bigger files and final color bit depth required. Then there is also noise from voltage fluctuations called read noise. So as you can see, the whole process of converting photons into images is tarnished by noise. But to simplify, we could say that it's mainly the amplification process above the default ISO that causes greater signal distortion or higher signal to noise ratio, which adds more noise to an image. In recent years, with advances in sensor technology, such as microlensing directly above the photo sites and back illuminated sensors with advanced wiring, it means that photons are converted more efficiently and the amplification process can be ramped up quite high before it becomes too detrimental to an image. The amplification process is also complicated. The sensor response is linearized so that if you double the light, the signal is doubled. Manufacturers also add processing in the form of curves to the signal after the analog to digital converter. Hasselblad, for example, add a small S-curve to make the image more analog and film-like. Let's look at some examples. I've just spent the last two hours shooting comparison ISO images on the Hasselblad and on the Sony. Here are the results of the 100 megapixel Hasselblad sensor at 100 ISO and then at 200, 400, 800, 1600, 3200, 6400, 12800 and 25600. And here are the results for the Sony A7S III at 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, 3200, 6400, 12800, and 25600. We also filmed in log video mode on the Sony to clearly demonstrate the dual native ISO capabilities. Here, you will notice that the noise actually improves when we reach 12,800 ISO. The dual ISO sensors have an additional processing circuit. Normal sensors have an analog amplifier before the analog to digital converter. 
and then a digital amp after. Dual ISO sensors have a separate larger analog amp before the ADC as well. You can think of this as preamp in a hi-fi system, and they allow a cleaner, smoother analog signal enhancement. The Sony A7S III that we just demonstrated is also only a 12 megapixel camera, designed primarily for video and not stills. And the lesser amount of megapixels means much bigger photo sites or buckets to catch the light. And with bigger buckets, it means the electronic processing and amplification can be more effective, albeit with less resolution because it only needs to generate 4K video, which is approximately equivalent to 12 megapixels. In the Hasselblad, we still have excellent high ISO performance, even though we have 100 megapixels. Partially though, because we're working with a larger sensor. But also keep in mind that proprietary software may mean that some noise reduction processing is automatically applied. But it's interesting to note that not all noise is actually bad. Certain levels of uniform monochromatic noise can be used to eliminate banding in gradating tones, such as backgrounds. And noise can be deliberately added to images, especially for printing. That can actually increase perceptual sharpness. Intentional use of noise can, if used correctly, actually be very useful in many areas of photography, including just for creative effect. And today's modern cameras are miles ahead of even a few years ago, and a million miles ahead of high ISO film. Now we can shoot 3200 ISO with hardly any noise or literally film in the dark. In this clip, I'm filming at over 70 meters deep, and to my eyes, it's almost pitch black. But on my screen, it's like night vision. Through modern camera technology, I'm able to film at 12,800 ISO at 5.6 and capture a scene that would otherwise be almost pitch black. With the introduction of new sensor technology, we will continue to see ongoing improvements in high ISO performance. And that's only a good thing because it opens up many more creative possibilities. But all of this is really just nerd stuff. What you really need to know is how high can we push our ISO before the picture becomes unusable? And you may have different opinions on what unusable actually is. For example, if you're shooting low light wedding images, then your level of acceptable noise may be much higher than would be acceptable for an advertising image. There is also very effective noise reduction software not my favorite solution, but it can get you out of the shit if you're desperate. Take this image here. When we look closely, you can see the noise. But if you run the image through Topaz Denoise software, then you can get that noise down. But by and large, nearly every modern camera is capable of performing beyond our needs in 95% of the situations that we need it to. What we should really be focusing on is how to use light. And I mean, use it well beyond the normal levels of lighting knowledge. Because even with the best camera, best lens or best whatever, none of it will matter if you don't know the intricate skills of controlling and working with light. Your pictures could have the best, lowest levels of noise possible, but it won't matter if the picture isn't very good. And using light is the key. It's those skills that will set you apart. And it's only at visualeducation.com that you're going to find the real knowledge to make the difference.